Right, well, there's lots of uh, rain around and lots of wind. And uh, yesterday I looked outside and I thought, it looks like it's going to stop now. And then just as I thought to go outside, yeah, it started raining again. So it was pretty well a full day inside uh, for us. And um, that's good. Did lots of reading and uh, viewed a few YouTube uh, movies and got myself up to speed with certain topics that I needed to look at. And um, looking out at the weather, it's so, so good to get some fresh freshness back into the land, although the pond is getting pretty high now. If you know, if you've been to our place, that pond is getting quite high now. So if we have another episode of rain, I'm quite sure it's going to start flowing over. Uh, but it won't go over anywhere. We know exactly where it's going to go. So we're not so worried about it. Uh, we sort of, the last time that happened, we were worried about the people below in their house, but now we know where it's going to go. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time and for the opportunity, Lord, to, to search and see. And this topic, Lord, has been enlightening and helpful, Lord, in our understanding of the Scriptures. We, we ask, Lord, that You would anoint our minds to understand further Thy truths. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now we have been looking at oh, what happened there? okay we have been looking at uh, various topics to do with this UV and Ws of the of RD and right division is really a massive topic and uh, right division if you're new to it what you need to do is you need to look at some basic introductory ideas uh, and we have got a series of talks on that the ABCs of right division. And those will be very enlightening to get started. But what you need after that is you need to get to the point where you can get into some meat. And that's what we're trying to do here with this, this study we're doing, the UV and Ws of RD. Uh, like I said, I think it's a nice idea to look at some current events. If you look at the, um, the, 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 the statements in the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a re redress of grievances. You know, this whole business of uh, freedom of speech is really under attack today, isn't it? And it's coming to us in weird kind of places. Uh, when I went through university, the University of Auckland in New Zealand, uh, it was not a, a place that was for the faint-hearted. I mean, it was a rough outfit when I first went through. I mean, they took freedom of speech right to the limit. We had out-and-out out communists coming into, onto the campus and preaching their stuff. But, to be fair, uh, they were challenged. And the university students said, yeah, how many millions did you kill? You know, how many, how many millions have died through communism? And this was exposed. And so while it was a rough environment, I have to say that the usage of freedom of speech actually put things in their right place, and things settled down. And students got to say, yeah, yeah, okay, I can see that, yeah, but they're exposed. You know, they're exposed to what they are. Knowledge was available. But what we are seeing today is just the most crazy situation where people claiming to be anti-fascists are actually the fascists <laughs> and they will not accept an opposite point of view and will lash out with violence they will not discuss things they will not allow free speech they say that they are anti-fascists but they themselves act like fascists and there are groups who support this that, are, that is, there are groups of people who claim to believe that we should have free speech, and yet they, in contradiction, support this. Which I, I just find it just a, an amazing, all sorts of levels of irony going through this. And it's really weird time to live, isn't it? What we see in America at the moment. Moving on to that, we last time we had a good look at all sorts of things to do with the mysteries. Uh, this is actually a little bit back, and so I'll just take you forward a little bit further to where we got to. Um, so we have looked at these mysteries of Ephesians, um, and we looked at the fact that there's a neat uh, lineup of this idea between the mystery of Christ and its ultimate perfection in the 
mystery. The mystery of Christ and the mystery. And we'll find the same thing comes up through uh, the passage that we're going to read soon in Colossians. So let's go to the book of Colossians and have a look at this. And just before I do, I want to remind uh, everyone about this idea of uh, right division. So what, what is it about right division that really attracts our attention? Well, right division, in one way, is simply just, uh, one way to look at it, is simply to see it as putting the Bible in order and understanding how things are happening in time, what God's purpose is in time. I mean, we can, we can look at all sorts of things. Let's just do a quick uh, look at things. Uh, today, um, we find the Christian church is fairly confused. And it's systematically put into confusion by many ministers who seem uh, to want to gloss over things that differ. Um, and, for example, many people simply live their Christian lives in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's where they basically get their food. Their spiritual food comes out of the Gospels. And they forget that after the cross, there was also a work of the Spirit of God. And that there was a movement of God to try and reach the nation of Israel through the preaching of the apostles, and specifically one man, the Apostle Paul. So that this man Paul now was used to reach out to the Jews and use the Gentiles to provoke the Jews to jealousy. And they, they miss out on this truth. And furthermore, not only do they miss out on this truth, but they miss out on the, the culmination of things, the, the culmination of what happened as Israel progressively went against the, the, this ministry and finally was divorced. They miss out on the ministry of Paul, the prisoner. And this ministry is something that is just not taught. It's just, a, I don't know anything about it, many Christians might say. What is that? These tremendous divisions are kept away from people so that they live in here. And because these doctrines and teachings that are in this particular time are relevant to a bygone era, they find it hard to make these doctrines work today. So what do they do? Well, have you seen kids playing with the, you know, these little toys they have and they have little uh, sort of round holes and there's uh, square holes and, you know, then there's triangular holes and, and the kids, they finally work out, oh, it's no sense trying to put the cylinder through the triangular hole. It's not going to work. And so they, finally they work out, yeah, this is the one to put it through. And that will work. But what it seems to me that many ministers are doing is they're trying to take their teachings and the philosophy and the mission of the disciples and Jesus in this particular age and they're trying to force it into our age when it just doesn't work. And so they've got to force things. And they've got to use all sorts of homiletical techniques to round out those sharp edges and sort of squeeze it into the hole where it does not fit. Whereas understanding this progress of doctrine, well, we were going to read this Colossians, but since we, you know, I'm going to take a little rabbit trail, do something I'm not supposed to do, and just have a look at this. Have a look at this passage in uh, Matthew 15, and then we'll look at another passage. But look at Matthew 15, um, and... This is, well, let's see, I'll find the verse. It's around about verse 22 or somewhere around there. 21. Matthew 15 and 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed under the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Here comes a woman. She has great need. This uh, daughter of hers 
has a devil. Notice she comes, calls Jesus Lord, son of David, invoking his position as Messiah right there as the son of David. He answered her, not a word. But notice the, the first word in verse 23, but. It's a very strong adversative there. But, you see, a woman with need coming to the great physician. But. You know, oh, I need help. But. It's a very strong thing. But he answered her, not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after. So just you know, deal with her problem. And just get rid of her, you know. And then it goes on. And uh, verse 24, But he answered, again with this word, but, but he answered and said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh, gulp. Here is a Gentile woman needing help, a Syrophoenician woman needing help, and then comes the but. And then the disciples, in their sort of feeling of, you know, well, this is kind of like an embarrassing situation. Let's just, just deal with her and let's get on our way. No. No, no, I'm making a point here. Jesus is making a very strong... So there's two buts in there that are important. There's the but that gives you this idea that there's need. There's great need. From the great physician, but the great physician, but. Then the disciples are saying, well, yeah, just deal with it. But, no, it's not going to happen. He answered, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it's not me to take the children's bread and cast. See these buts coming on down here. And she said, truth, Lord. Okay, so the woman, the woman says truth. Man, do we ever need truth. And the truth of the Gospels is coming up to you Gentile people. You who want to somehow take the teaching of the Gospels and make them fit. Here comes something you're going to have real hard time grinding the edges away of with your nice smooth language you're going to have to do some work on this you want to make it fit it's not meat verse 26 but he answered and said it's not meat to take the children's bread oh wait a minute the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Now you can argue and say what well, really means just puppies. Okay, puppies. All right, little puppy dogs. And she said, "Truth, Lord, yet the dogs, the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table." Then Jesus answered and said unto her, "O woman." Great is thy faith. <laughs> oh, what was it? What was the content that turned the Lord around and does something for the Syrophoenician? What was it? Great is thy faith. Also, what was the content of her faith? Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. What was it that gave the Gentile woman her wishes granted. What was it? It was an acknowledgement of the fact that she was under the table eating the crumbs. Right? That's the harsh part of this. That's the harsh part. That when the Lord came, He came to His own. And eventually what happened was His own received Him not. Right? Eventually that's what happened. And in this process, a new ministry was given to Paul the prisoner. And until such time as Christians face up to this, you are going to be filing off the edges, man. And playing like a little kid trying to put stuff in the wrong hole. 
You know what I mean? That's all you're going to do. And I've come to recognize this. Now, if you go across from there, look at Luke 16. So in the Bible, there are things which are dispensational. That is, they relate to an economy. And the economy over here, the, the economy back here was Israel, her hope, her promises. I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's it, Jesus Christ's ministry. When he walked the earth, that's what he did, man. And you're trying to take these teachings and try and make them work on us today? That's wrong division. That's wrong division. What we want is right division. Okay, so just have a look at this one now. So let's go across to uh, Luke 16. I'm going to show you another type of teaching which, which relates to um, understanding the Bible in order. Luke 16 and let's see, it's around about verse, let me find it, 19. Luke 16 verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a, rich, a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. Now, before we carry on, what I'm trying to get at here is that there are lots of levels of understanding you've got to get in the Bible. One is clearly to do with the teachings which relate to an age. But surely there are going to be some teachings that you understand from the age in which they were given, but they are true for all time because they relate to doctrines about generalities. God's feelings of right and wrong. Things that relate to uh, man's nature. What, how is man made up? What's the nature of us? Body, soul, spirit. What are the natures of these three components? Well, the whole Bible will give us teachings on that. But it's still true that we must understand the context in which these things are taught. Okay, so Luke 16 and verse 19, it talks about this rich man. Verse 20, and there was a certain beggar, Lazarus. Verse 21, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which f fell from the rich man's table... Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and Lazarus, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue that I am tormented in this flame. What's going on here? Well, again, if you want to live in the Gospels, then what you're going to have to do is get the context of the Gospels and you have to understand what is being said here about Abraham's bosom. And you have to understand something about hell in the teaching of Jesus in relationship to the Pharisees. So in here, you get the same questions that must be asked. You must ask, who is saying this and in what context? And if you go down further, look what it says. Um, verse 29. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Which is Jesus Christ, right? So what, what the Lord is doing here is he is using their false notions about the afterlife to bring judgment on them. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know that I am the son of David? Don't you know that I am Messiah? You have not been listening to Moses and the prophets. 
And therefore you will not listen, though one rose from the dead. Right? That's the witness. And we find that happening, don't we? They will not repent. They will not listen to this witness of the Lord Jesus Christ ascended glory. Will not listen to the ministry given by the apostles through, empowered through the Holy Spirit. No, they won't have this band or rule over them. No, we will not listen. And so what God does is he says, all right, have it your way. I'm going to divorce you, not forever. There's going to come a time when I'm going to bring you back. But in the meantime, I've got a secret purpose that I'm going to bring forth through Paul, the prisoner. Orem, gold man, hitting gold. We have hit gold. Now, we hit gold, but we have to be honest. We get so used to this gold that sometimes we don't acknowledge it as gold. We're just well, ho-hum, you know, ho-hum. It's just every day. We're used to it. But you know something? If the Christian church would come to understand this, man, the strength of unity that could come from I'm not, don't worry, I'm under no false illusions. We as human beings will divide up to some degree. We'll find some reason to argue with each other and find differences. I'm not saying that if the whole Christian community understood Paul's right division, understand, understood Acts 28, understood these things, that somehow we're all going to be perfectly united. No, because we're fallen creatures. I understand that won't happen. But there will be far more unity. There will be far less of the kind of garbage that's going on where people get taken off into various Pentecostal type stuff and are fooled, man. And everybody looks back that's got a brain intact and says, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. What is going to be the end result of all of this cultism that comes out of false teaching? It's going to be lack of faith, man. What did Jesus see in the Syrophoenician woman? He saw faith when she acknowledged right the vision. Right? And he answered her request upon the acknowledgement of the truth. And the acknowledgement of the truth here was Jesus Christ was not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was the acknowledgement people had to have here. What is the acknowledgement we must have here? Ah, now Paul tells us in Ephesians 3. He tells us what we must acknowledge. And that relates to the revelation of the mystery. We're studying this in the book of Colossians. Now we go to Colossians. After my rabbit trail. Don't you just love rabbits? There was a movie come out. What was it called? Uh, something about rabbits and uh, warrens. And they had this, this kind of sad song uh, about this, these rabbits being rounded up and killed and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> but uh, this particular rabbit trail, I'm sure, is a little bit happier than that. Now, we'll just go across to Colossians chapter number 1. Uh, and this is a great book. Okay, we've looked at the mysteries of Ephesians and saw some great symmetry and connection to the mystery of Christ, so we shall find here as well. And in Colossians chapter number 1, we'll read just a little bit back here. It says this in verse 20. So this is Colossians 1.20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Wow. Now you think about the extent of the cross work of Christ. Things in heaven also. It's a massive accomplishment that God made in Christ. And it doesn't just influence the earth. No, no. In the heavens as well. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Beautiful. We look at our own lives, we see the wickedness in our own lives, we, we see our own fallenness, and we need grace, man, do we need grace. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Look at the next word, what is it? F. Whoa. So there's a condition. If you continue in the faith, 
grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Wait a minute. There are lots of gospels in the Bible. We must be clear. We must be clear about this gospel. Just hold your place here because the sister epistle makes this much clearer for us. And I'm sure God expects us to compare. Look at Ephesians 3 with, with me and verse 6. And this Ephesians 3, we read through a little bit last time, talks about the mystery. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. This is the gospel Paul had been preaching. By the gospel. Now, it goes through a little interlude, talking about the Gentiles, fellow heirs, etc. Um, and then verse 7, whereof I was made a minister. Verse 8, unto me, whom less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles. Oh, what, so what's the contents of this? What's the contents of this gospel? Verse 8, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. This is the thing which is in common. This is the common. You know, when you look in Jude, it talks about the common salvation, right? The thing which is common. The thing which is to be included. Well, what is the thing which is to be common here? The part that is the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ. It is this mystery. Coming back over here to Colossians. Look what I mean here. So over in Colossians chapter number 1. It says this in verse uh, 23. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. So if you do move away from the hope of the gospel, then there can be loss. This gospel, the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now you're saved by God's grace. You can't lose that. That's a gift, man. You've got it. But this gospel, you can hear the truth of it. You might even acknowledge it at some stage, but then you can move away from it, right? You can move away from it, and you've probably seen people do that, but there's going to be a consequence for you moving away from this in terms of reward. Look what it says. If you continue in the faith, ground and said, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Yes, Paul was made this minister and he got that message out he did it boy he was really into this and he gave his life to do it now we come to one of the most amazing passages in paul's epistles i said one not the only one who now rejoice in my sufferings for you oh now who wait a minute what is this who 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 well, the last clause of verse 23, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Who? That's Paul. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. He's rejoicing in his sufferings for the Ephesians. And fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ... In my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now, this requires some thinking. Because let me ask you a question. Do you think there were things that were lacking in Christ's afflictions? The things that Christ suffered? Do you think Christ didn't quite do it all? <laughs> no. We know that his work on the cross, complete. Absolutely Perfect. The writer of Hebrews says that this is so. That he, he was the one who went all the way for the joy. Went all the way to the cross and completed the work. So, what's Paul saying here? Well, look at this a little bit more carefully. It says, uh, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Oh, now he's talking about his own personal sufferings. Paul's sufferings. And fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. Ah, now we've got the qualifications. You see, what happened was, there was work that Paul began, right? 
He began some afflictions for the body. He started it. But he had not perfected it. It had not been brought to completion. The afflictions of Christ in his own body. Because he was a servant of Christ. And therefore he would be suffering to make known the truth of the gospel. Of the unsearchable riches of Christ. And he was to make this per perfect. Fill up that which is behind. Fill up that which was lacking in the sufferings of Christ. In his own body. In his own flesh. And he goes on. Which is the church. Christ in my flesh for his body's sake. Which is the church. You get the point he's getting at here. And he goes on in verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God. Oh, this word dispensation is so hated by some people. Oh, man, it's just bad news. Dispensational truth. Oh, you're a dispensationalist. As if that's, you know, a negative thing. It's a real bad thing to be a dispensationalist. Right here, my friends. Paul was a dispensationalist. He acknowledges it right here. He says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God. Which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. You, my friends, you may want to live in the Gospels. And you may be trying to take things from an oikonomia back here. Household rules here. And you're trying to fight with the most basic doctrines all your life. But if you grab the meat, if you grab the perfecting knowledge, then you understand that back here, man, you can, at most you can only have a glass half full. You can only have a glass half full over here. But if you want to get a glass that is filled to the top, man, of pristine water. Have you ever tasted water that is from a brook that's running through rock? And it's clean and there's nothing in there, man, but beautiful water that's just come straight out of this brook, cold and refreshing. There's nothing like it, man. Oh, you know. Have you ever really been thirsty? Really thirsty. And then someone comes to you with a cup of tea. <laughs> I don't want a cup of tea. Or someone comes to you with a, some sort of soda and you're really thirsty. Ah, oh, No. What do you want? Water. That's what you want. You want clear, clean, cool water. And that's what's going to really hit your body and give you the help you need. Man, what you need is a full cup or glass of water, man. Straight from the brook. Not from downstream. You know, so many Christians are drinking downstream, man. Muddied waters. Unclean. Dirty. With all sorts of bacteria in there. What you need, man, is some clean water from the fountainhead. Boy, I am feeling good today. <laughs> okay. And so, to fulfill the word of God. That's what it does, man. This is the dispensation of God given to Paul. It fills to the full the word of God. Otherwise, in practical speaking, you don't have a full Bible. Unless you get this. You say, but, I, but I got it all here. Yeah, but you haven't accepted it, right? You have not taken from this the fullness, which is what we need. And it says this. Look what it says. Verse 26. In case you don't get this. Even the mystery. Oh, but I, did, I, 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 don't, I don't see that. I don't see that this is the... Even the mystery. You got it spelled out for you. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations. Dispensational phrase, my friends. But now, oh man, is made manifest to his saints. Man, this teaching is so powerful, it's so life-changing, that I often say this. That after being saved, after being saved by the power of God through Christ's finished work on the cross, 
This is the next thing that a Christian needs to know. Needs to get this. Needs to understand this. This is the next big step in a Christian's life is to understand this. And we are magnificently endowed with this responsibility to take Christians to this next step. That's our responsibility. I believe that. And let's pray and hope that it happens. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time, for all the teaching that's in the Scriptures, and for the, the great mystery which has given Paul the prisoner. We pray that people would see that it was hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to His saints. We thank Thee, our Father, for this truth. In Christ's name, amen.